Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the workshop. It's fantastic to have you here as ever. We are working on making a Viking sword, which is very, very exciting. We need to work on the guard. We also then need to eventually start working on the upper guard. More about that later. For now, I want to thank today's sponsor, which is Audible. Audible is the audio book playing platform that I use and really, really, really love. Right now, I am listening to the definitive collection of Sherlock Holmes by Arthur Conan Doyle, read by Stephen Fry, and it is just fantastic. Audible is giving you guys a free trial and a free audiobook when you sign up at audible.com forward slash forge. And you can also text forge to 500 500. Thank you, Audible, for sponsoring the video. Thank you guys for being here. Let's jump right in. And so it's time to get in the grinding room and give this a little tweak to fix yesterday's mistake. What was yesterday's mistake? It was getting the order of operations wrong. I started to try and fit up the guard before my tang to blade transition. Oh, I just hit my elbow. Oh, I just hit my funny bone right on that lathe wheel. Oh. We need to grind that transition. One thing that I forgot to mention, in order to square this file guide, I took a center measurement from the middle of the blade and a center measurement from the end of the tang. Because I had ground all this stuff to be central anyway, I was then able to put a square up to the file guide, line it up to that scribe line, and bada bing, bada boom, this is square. And now we take a round file and we file a radius. One of the grave mistakes that I made on some of my earlier pieces was not having a radius transition between the tang and the blade. Why do we want this radius? Well, without a radius, it creates a stress concentration and can mean that you risk fracturing the blade at this point. So that's looking good. I'm gonna take the file guide off. So now it's back to the fitter. It looks close, but we've still got another little, little bit to go. Now what I'm doing is using a round file to make a little radius right in here for the radius that we've just put on the sword to be able to match up to so that the bottom of the sword will sit nicely at the bottom of our little guard indentation. So, a little more filing to go. Carbide burr. We have a guard that fits all the way up to where it needs to go, and it's nice and tight once it's up there. So this is good, this is exciting. We're slowly progressing, we're slowly making progress. What I now need to do is we're going to use our favorite layout fluid ever, scribe some marks on it, so that we take what is a square guard like this, and we give it a nice convex shape like this. I wanna make sure that the corners are nicely radiused so it doesn't feel too abrupt on the hand. One of the things I noticed on the falchion, a mistake I made there, I just made like a small 45 degree chamfer on the corner of the guard there and on the corners of the pommel, it was only slightly radiused. And you know, and that all works against your hand and I thought, you know what, that could do with a little more radius. So we want a little more radius on this. Wrong order, wrong order. Order of operations, Alec. We need blue dike.
this looks beautiful. A30 Trizact finish equivalent to an 800 grit. Nice off the grinder finish. Very pleased with that. Let me just replay something as we were filming that little nice thing. It went something like this. I was looking at it and I'm like, oh yes, nice lined up with the edge. And then I did this. No! Look at it. It's twisted. Arrgh. After all that nice work getting that beautiful finish, <laughs> it's time to go down grits and straighten that side out. So I finally got it ground up and it's looking nice and it is looking square and neat and beautiful, which is good. It takes time to make a really nice piece. It takes a huge amount of time and a huge amount of effort and it takes constantly having to go back a little bit to fix the mistakes you made because you were lazy. I didn't pay enough attention. I was lazy. I fixed the mistake and it's now on to the next step. This is the lower guard, as you've heard me mention in previous episodes. Normal sword that you will have seen us work on, it's constructed with a guard, a grip, and then a thing at the end that's usually called a pommel. The Viking sword is different in the sense that we don't just have a guard, a grip, and a pommel, but we have a guard, a grip, a lower guard, and then a little pommel. I think we'll call it a pommel cap. I don't know if that's appropriate. We're gonna call it a pommel cap because what happens is the tang goes through the lower guard and it's riveted only at the level of the lower guard. Now the lower guard has holes going all the way through in two points, and then the pommel, the reason I want to call it a pommel cap, caps on top of this with some studs that go through the hole for it to then be riveted from inside the upper guard. I think the reason that this is done is for an easier disassembly of the entire construction, because what you can do is you can simply file these rivet heads off, remove the pommel cap, file off the tang, and then be able to very simply just bring it down a little bit further if you need to regrip it. I think that's the reason. I'd love to hear in the comments down below if uh, other people have a better idea of what the reason is, but I think it's so that you can refit this thing for a huge amount of time. One of the fascinating, fasc ooh, books, ah, it was right here. One of the fascinating things about learning about the Viking sword is how some swords were passed from generation to generation, from father to son to grandson to great grandson. So you end up having a sword that was made in the seventh century end up still being used in the 10th century, but it's interesting because you'll then end up with a sword blade type that's much more akin to an earlier piece with hilts that have nothing to do with that time period. Of course, there is a there is a gradation, you know, there is a there is a way that the hilts work through time and how their styles changed. And my understanding is that that's because they were passed down from generation to generation, and so things would have potentially needed to be rehilted in a time period very different to that of when the actual blade itself was made. What I am now going to do is I'm going to work out an appropriate proportion for our lower guard and our pommel cap. We're going to draw it because I certainly know I'm going to struggle to make anything without a design to go off of, and we're going to cut some steel, and we're going to start making those. This is what I need. And this is really ridiculously light. Arr. Oh my goodness, I just did maths and it worked. Right, so I've done a little calculation and with the plan for the upper guard, it's gonna end up being 76 grams, good. We've got 162 grams or so to work with, which means that for the pommel, we can let it be about 80 or 90 grams or so.
There's our scribe line. We have our upper guard sitting nice and tight, nice and close to it. With a little hammering, it goes right up to the scribe line so that this distance here is 85 millimeters, which is nice and historically appropriate. And let me tell you, despite the fact that this is now digging into me because it's not been shaped and rounded and yada yada yada, oh my goodness, does this sword suddenly feel like it is coming alive suddenly feel like I have a control over it that is just phenomenal. It's starting to get to the point where this has the balance and the feel that it should have. There are a few little kind of tests and examples you can do to see, I don't know what they, I think they call, I think Peter Johnson calls this the center of rotation, where you just uh, shake the blade around, holding it at the hilt, and you see where it is that that sword stops. There's all sorts of fun, interesting things that you can see. You can see where are the nodes of the, you can see where the nodes of the sword are. And as far as I understand, it's rather co Right, let's, let's demonstrate it when the sword's finished. Right, so the next step is we drill our two holes for our rivets. We give this some blue dicum and we grind this up to look pretty similar to that right there. does that look so good. The surface finish on these pieces is just glorious and it does feel comfortable. These had short grips and Showa Gladiatoria on YouTube has a video that shows you how these were likely held even with those short grips. It feels great. So I'm very excited to continue cracking on, make our pummel cap in the next episode. And I'm also thrilled that Audible is sponsoring this episode and Audible has been entertaining me today. As I said, Earlier, I've been listening to the definitive collection of Sherlock Holmes and I'm loving it. The words are just, I mean, it is phenomenal how beautifully the words are meshed together into incredible sentences. The language with, with which these works are written, I'm absolutely loving it. Absolutely loving hearing of the tales of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. And I would be thrilled if you would go to the link in the description, which is audible.com forward slash forge to grab Grab yourself a free trial when you sign up and you can also get a free audio book. You can also get this by texting FORGE to 500, 500 So you can listen to 70 hours of Sherlock Holmes for free when you sign up at my link. Audiobooks are just a fantastic way to pass time as you're working in the workshop, as you're commuting, or as you're enjoying the nature in this glorious summer we have. Thank you, Audible, for sponsoring the video and giving us wonderful stories and great information right at our fingertips. Thank you guys for being here, and I cannot wait to see you on the next episode as we keep crashing on with this Viking sword. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye.